He's read more books than any student I've ever taught. Unfortunately, most were not assigned. <laughs> but I used to go down to the basement uh, that last semester of college with Coleman, and I would uh, preach a sermon, and he would rip it to pieces, and I'd come back, and when I finished, this was, of course, not, not an academic credit exercise, and when I finished the semester, uh, he said, now you know how to preach, don't let anyone change you. Uh, and when I preached my first uh, sermon in homiletics, uh, taught by the great Christopher Stendhal, my great men one of my great mentors at Harvard, um, he called it the art of preaching. Uh, when I finished, he pulled me aside um, and asked me, where did you learn how to preach? Uh, and then handed me my notes, which were laudatory except for the bottom comment, which said, you have a very fine preaching voice, and you're very proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's fun to write the song. I actually sweat, sweat it over it, um, because it, it is a different form, and it's a form that I haven't done for a while. Um, I wrote the book, as they mentioned, uh, American Fascists, The Christian Right and the War on America 10 years ago. And that book had its root in my relationship with uh, a great scholar, Robert James Luther Adams. He was then 80 when I had him. And uh, he would take two seniors uh, every year and do a, a British-style tutorial. Um, and his kind of sem the seminal moment, I would argue, in his life was being in Nazi Germany in 1936 uh, and 1937. He was bilingual in German. He was at the University of Heidelberg. He was in the lecture hall watching Martin Heidegger begin his lectures with a Nazi salute. Uh, and he told us, this was the early 1980s, that when we were his age, we would all be fighting the Christian fascists. Because he had seen in Nazi Germany, the rise of the so-called German Christian Church, which fused the iconography and language of the Nazi party with the Christian religion. So on one side of the altar, you had the Christian cross, and on the other side, you had the Nazi swastika. And he dropped out of Heidelberg, he joined the Confessing Church, the underground church led by Niemel or Bonhoeffer, Schweitzer. And he took home movies of not only uh, figures like Niemel, or, but of the German Christian Church itself. And I watched those black and white home movies uh, in his apartment in Cambridge as he narrated that. The rise of fascism always is covered by familiar and even comforting symbols and language. So German fascism is very different from Italian fascism. Mussolini rooted Italian fascism and the glories of the Roman Empire, while German fascism was rooted largely in Teutonic myth. And fascism arises in any society, no society is immune, when the social bonds are broken and destroyed. In my newest book, uh, I, I always have a, uh, when I write a book, I always often look to uh, a book that I admire 
as a sort of template. So when uh, the great uh, cartoonist uh, Joe Sacco and I did Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, uh, we uh, were echoing uh, James Agee and Walker Evans' uh, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. In this book, I really look to Durkheim, uh, who, in his book on suicide, 1897, when he went out and tried to ask the question, what is it that drives individuals and societies towards acts of self-annihilation? And he said it was the rupturing of those social bonds, that cohesion, that sense of dignity and place, that feeling that you have a role in a society that is larger than the self, which Durkheim says is a way to protect ourselves from impending mortality and our own smallness. And that when those social bonds are broken, then people engage in pathologies that are deeply self-destructive, what sociologists call diseases of despair, and what Durkheim called rulelessness, uh, anomie. That's how anomie in Durkheim is translated. And I think that idea of rulelessness is extremely important. <clears throat> because what Durkheim was saying is that the rules, however imperfect, the rules that govern a society, the idea that if you work hard, if you obey the law, if you get a good education, there's a place for you within that society no longer function. It, it, it's dangerous. I know Michael Moore did it, and I like Michael uh, at the end of his movie, uh, his latest film, equating Trump with Hitler. Um, Trump isn't Hitler. He's not smart enough to be Hitler. Uh, but it is important to go back and look at past societies that have disintegrated um, to get cues from how we can end up with these monstrosities. I covered the war in the former Yugoslavia, for example, for the New York Times. And it was the economic meltdown of Yugoslavia that vomited up these figures like Radovan Karadzic, Slobodan Milosevic, Franjo Tuzman, and saw a dispossessed working class retreat into mythical ethnic narratives about themselves. I was in Montgomery, Alabama a couple of years ago with a great civil rights attorney, uh, Brian Stevenson, who has spent his life defending uh, death row inmates in Alabama, almost all of whom were poor and black. And we were walking through the streets of Montgomery, after Montgomery Black. And if you enter Montgomery, when you enter the city, on the outskirts of the city is a huge Confederate flag. And Brian was pointing out all of the Confederate memorials that dotted the city. And he said, Almost all of these have been put up in the last 10 years. Oh, my gosh. And I said, that's exactly what happened in Yugoslavia. People for whom these social bonds were broken, their place was taken from them, their sense of dignity. And I'm no fan of John Paul II, but he wrote a brilliant encyclical on work, that work is far more than the exchange of labor for wages. Work is about giving a sense of purpose, a sense of status. Um, and when that, when that possibility to be a contributing member of society and to uh, have a certain stature and dignity is taken from you, then you begin to exhibit these dark pathologies that are rippling now across the United States. And for all of my books I travel, and I always report, um, because I've learned as a reporter uh, to, when you walk into uh, situations, even ones where you think you know what's going on, your assumptions are always challenged and often shattered. 
and that you don't fully understand what's happening until you spend hours listening. For example, in the book of the Christian right, I went to a pro-life weekend in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. And uh, this was held for what they call post-abortive sisters. And when they asked everyone in the room, it was about 400 women, they asked everyone in the room who had had an abortion to stand, the room, whole room stood. And when I went around and started doing interviews, it wasn't that they had had one abortion, they often had multiple abortions. And what the Christian right, in particular a group called Priests for Life, were doing is they were taking these women and giving them dolls and telling these women that these were the children they murdered. And they had to name the dolls, bathe the dolls for the weekend, dress the dolls, sleep with the dolls. And at the end of the weekend, they had to beg, and it was quite emotional, beg for forgiveness. And then make a vow to fight and obliterate the culture of death, which is us. It was only then that I understood the true undercurrent, the subterranean undercurrent of the so-called right to life movement. The Christian right, it, it, it's a bit of a misnomer because the iteration of uh, Christian fundamentalism or Christian evangelicalism has no relation to what it was 50 or 100 years ago when believers were called upon to remove themselves from the contaminants of secular society. What happened is that in the 1970s, especially under a um, quasi-Nazi philosopher named Rusev Svarstuni, is that uh, there was a formulation of a millennialist version which said that uh, rather than living the Christian life and removing yourself from the contaminants, secular contaminants around you, uh, believers were called to create the Christian society. And this was heavily funded by uh, the most retrograde forces of American capitalism. Uh, it saw the purging of all sorts of divinity schools, and it gave birth to an ideology that's more uh, probably correctly called dominionism. Uh, and, and, and this saw the rise of powerful institutions, uh, uh, Liberty University, Patrick Henry Law School, uh, a whole a uh, range of educational institutions. Michael Pence's wife uh, teaches in one, I don't know if you saw, which of course does not allow for LGBT uh, uh, people to be involved in the school. Um, and powerful and pervasive media systems, Christian broadcasting, uh, that hermetically seal uh, tens of millions of Americans within its grip. So that all of their educational information, religious information, everything comes through this bizarre filter. And I write in that book that the attraction of this form of magical thinking, because that's what it is, it's magical thinking, stems from the dislocation. When I originally started writing that book, I did so with all of the prejudices that come from within many of us who come out of the, in my case, the left wing of the Christian church, the Barrigans, Dorothy Day. Um, but when I heard the stories of suffering and struggle on the part of the uh, followers of this movement, uh, you would have to be heartless not to respond. Uh, domestic abuse, uh, sexual abuse, evictions, uh, bankruptcies, uh, struggle with uh, opioids, uh, struggles with pornography, struggles with all of the kind of pathologies that I describe in this book, which have beset a society in deep 
decline. Um, and it's always despair. I mean, all of the writers of fascism, whether it's Hannah Arendt in Origins of Totalitarianism or Fritz Stern in The Politics of Cultural, it's despair that's the starting point. That it finally becomes so difficult to cope in the real world that the only way you can endure psychologically is to retreat into a world of magical thinking. And magical thinking, Hannah Arendt writes in The Origins of Totalitarianism, is a central feature of all totalitarian movements. And it becomes a coping mechanism. So at the end of that book, I said, you will never break this movement by trying to argue these people out of their beliefs in creationism. However absurd these beliefs are in a, to, a rational, to a rational world. I was in the Creationist Museum in Peterborough, Kentucky, and it's a huge building with massive parking lots for school buses. And when you go in it, the first and they brought in the people who did the animatronic uh, figures from Universal Studios. You have a recreation of the Garden of Eden with a waterfall and uh, Adam and Eve were plastic figures and Eve positioned so you can't see her breasts or anything. Um, and there's a T-Rex because Adam and Eve, I guess, rode the T-Rex around or something. And the guy is saying, well, I'm sure you all wonder why uh, the T-Rex had such big teeth. Um, well, that's because Adam and Eve used the T-Rex to open the coconuts. <laughs> and, and then you go into the next room, and it's a replica of Noah's Ark. And the person taking us through says, I know you're all wondering, how did Noah get the dinosaurs on the ark? Well, Noah only put baby dinosaurs on the ark. <laughs> now he goes, for us it's kind of amusing, but it's terrifying when you're with a group of 50 people who believe it. <laughs> and so this anatomy, this rupturing of social bonds caused by a global oligarchic elite who created the ruling ideology of neoliberalism, which doesn't make any economic sense. I mean, they have to resurrect the most marginal and discredited economists like Hayek and uh, you know, Milton Friedman and Ayn Rand, who can't, who's a third-rate novelist. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that's what ruling ideologies are. It has no more validity than the divine right of kings or fascism or communism or anything else. Uh, but it's been shoved down our throats. And it has quite effectively left industrial countries uh, uh, stripped, deindustrialized. Uh, with programs of austerity. You know, in, 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 if you read the, the late history of Weimar, and this is Evans and Kershaw and others, they talk about in 1928, before the 1929 crash, the Nazi party was polling in the single digits. Figures like uh, Goebbels and Goring, and these were buffoonish figures in Germany. And then you, every night in the cabarets, in Berlin, they were made fun of. And then the crash came, and Ebert and the Social Democrats, the, the liberals of their day, to appease the international banking system, imposed draconian forms of austerity, including abolishing unemployment insurance. And this gave rise to the grotesque figures uh, that led the Nazi party, just as it gave rise to those grotesque figures in Yugoslavia when the society ceased to function. Because what happens in a society that becomes captured by financial interests, as Karl Polanyi wrote, writes in The Great Transformation, uh, is that they create a mafia economy 
and then they create a mafia government. So that the kleptocracy of the Trump administration, which is naked and open, uh, builds on uh, or essentially erases the veneer of a functioning democracy and uh, empowers uh, open theft, not only for Trump and his family, which is making a fortune, even though it violates the emolument clause for which he could be impeached, uh, but for all of the banks and the corporations, Goldman Sachs. There is no way within the American political system you can vote against the interests of Goldman Sachs. It's impossible, and every administration, including the Trump administration, proves it. And so, you know, we, I, we often hear Obama used to do this mantra about education. You know, we, we need to educate our people more, the education is somehow the solution. No, no, it, the, the people who sold us out were the best educated, Larry Summers and all of these figures. The problem was greed. And these global corporations, which have now pushed through within the United States uh, a massive tax cut, in effect, for most of these corporations, it's a tax boycott, are pillaging to such an extent that they are fueling this anomaly, this dislocation, this retreat into magical thinking. And so that's why Trump is the symptom, not the disease. All of the groundwork for Trump's lies and, and narcissism and Manichaean bifurcation of the world into us and them it was all the spade work was done before. It's all part of the Christian right. I mean, I was in mega church after mega church, and again, it was fascinating to sit through. I took a, I don't know how well you versed you are on this stuff, but I went down to Fort Lauderdale. Actually, took a seminar called Evangelism Explosion, taught by T. Uh, James Kennedy with mortal fear that somebody in the room would Google me. Um, <laughs> very mercenary. I mean, there wasn't any talk about Jesus, or it was all about targeting people who had lost a spouse or lost their job, uh, or were struggling with depression, or whose son had been killed in Iraq, or whatever. And uh, in the mega churches, you, you, they, again, Hannah Arendt was very instructive because you go to the service, and unlike in our Presbyterian churches, the seats are actually comfortable, um, and they have, like, well, I think it's, I think the music's awful, but it's, it's electronic, uh, and everybody's kind of hip, and it looks like a stage. Uh, but what happens is once they grab you, they suck you into. Uh, they, they, they assign disciples to you. And, and that's the difference between what Hannah Arendt called propaganda, which we see on the outside, and indoctrination. So it's quite, I used to sit with these prayer groups and people would be weeping. Because what happens when you're brought into these mega church structures, all of your free time is absorbed by the church. And if your husband or your child or is not part of the community, in essence, they're exiled from it. I mean, one of the things I found writing about the Christian right is they talk about family, family, family. They're the great destroyer of family. And I would sit in these prayer groups and people were weeping because someone or maybe most people in their family were not part of the collective. And they break me down. Margaret Singer's cults in our midst became a very important for me when I looked at the structure of megachurches. Now remember that most of the people who run these megachurches are millionaires. They're certainly very wealthy, preying off of people's despair in the same way that Trump in his casinos preyed off of people's despair. And they are in direct communication with God, they claim. They're almost invariably white male men. They can't be questioned. Um, they are 
megalomaniacs, they're narcissists. Um, and so I'll hear, well, how can Trump win 81% of the evangelical support? Um, and this is, of course, to give to this movement moral qualities it doesn't have. I would say it's anecdotal, but the only difference between Trump and these mega pastors is that the sexual proclivities of the mega pastors is probably kinkier. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that all of these movements that rise they paint themselves as moral forces. And Claudia uh, Kuntz uh, wrote a very good book on this called The Nazi Conscience. They paint themselves. I mean, look at Sarah Sanders. Um, this woman lies like we breathe. And yet she has the audacity. Uh, to present herself as uh, a stalwart of the Christian religion. And this, of course, was the great failure of the liberal church. They didn't call these people out for who they are, which are Christian heretics. Jesus did not come, and you don't need to spend, as I did, three years at Harvard Divinity School to figure this out. <laughs> Jesus did not come to make us rich. <laughs> Jesus did not come to bless the dropping of iron fragmentation bombs on the Muslim world. Jesus was not a capitalist. In fact, uh, and of course Jesus does not bless the white race above other races, because Jesus wasn't white. Jesus was a person of color. The Romans were white. And in the name of tolerance, a word Martin Luther King never used. We allowed these people to assume a religious legitimacy that they should have been denied. And we never fought. We never stood up. I speak as a member of the church. We never fought and stood up <coughs> for the gospel. And we're paying for it. Because they have largely hijacked Christian discourse. And they have the money and the resources and the platform to drown out the rest of us. So Trump arises from this long-standing enemy. And all of although he's more vulgar and he's crude, he expresses a legitimate rage that in particular the white working class feels on being betrayed. And they were betrayed. And part of what is so frightening is the bankruptcy of the liberal elites. So as Ralph Nader has pointed out many times, in the United States you only have one party, it's called the corporate party. And on one end you have nativist, racist, neo-confederate, misogynistic figures like Trump and Mike Pompeo, I don't know how well you follow American News, has just been uh, flying all over the Middle East talking about how he keeps a Bible open on his desk and what a great Christian he is. And then on the other you have the Clintons who speak in the language of diversity and inclusivity. But it's only diversity and inclusivity if you buttress support and promote the interests of the ruling 1%. So we now have, I don't know how many candidates, you can't keep track of it, every day there's a new Democrat. We're going to have over 20 people. But what, what, I don't recommend it. I don't own the television, so I only see it periodically, and it's always depressing. Um, but what is it that they're saying? Well, she's a woman. No, she's a black woman, although she's not really black, but it doesn't matter. She's dark skin, or, you know, olive skin. Um, Joe Biden can resonate with a working class. It's all, it, 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 there's no substance to it. It's all about identity 
politics. I mean, Trudeau's done this here. You know, there's a big difference between Thurgood Marshall and Clarence Thomas. Yes, they're both black. But one is a traitor, and the other is one of the great legal and moral minds of the 20th century. And the Democratic Party, of course, the lie of the Democratic Party, which actually fuels the right, is that somehow they actually look out for the interests of marginalized people and marginalized communities. But what they've done is upend, for instance, feminism. Feminism, and I love Andrea Dworkin, feminism, uh, as Andrea Dworkin understood, was about empowering oppressed women. But it becomes transformed in the hands of the ruling elite to having a woman CEO or a woman president. You know, I think we have like nine major defense contractors. These are merchants of death. These are the people that provide the weapons to bomb school buses filled with children in Yemen. Four or five of them, those CEOs are women. And it's the inability to look at content. And of course the media fuels it. So the Democratic Party will talk in the language of diversity and inclusion, but in fact we know statistically that since 2008, <coughs> African American families have suffered far more than any other segment of American society. In fact, you could argue that except for that black elite, African Americans in the United States are far worse off today than when King marched in Selma. So, the, the narrative that somehow marginal groups are watched over by this wing of the corporate party is a lie. But it actually feeds the narrative of the right. Because figures like Trump and other racists are saying, yes, everything was taken from you to give to them. You were sacrificed in order to empower undocumented workers and other segments of the society. I mean, the whole notion that the severe economic decline, remember in the United States, half of the country now lives in poverty. Half. Half of the country attempts to survive on $29,000 a year. I know that the corporate corporatists are just what they're doing to the National Health Service in Britain, trying to destroy your health program by underfunding it. They're trying to destroy the CBC. Harper in particular was the same thing they did on PBS and NPR. Because they, but, but in the United States, the, the cruelty of American capitalism uh, is unmatched anywhere in the industrialized world. I mean, the, 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 there, there's no control over this for-profit healthcare system. A million people a year go into bankruptcy because of medical bills, and they have insurance. I mean, in the United States, in moral terms, it is legally permissible for corporations to hold children hostage while their parents bankrupt themselves trying to save their sons and daughters. And Trump plays to this rage and this anger. So when he is belittling the elites, whether it's Jeb Bush or Hillary Clinton, people feel that there is a kind of catharsis, that at least he's expressing the anger. Now, of course, he's a con artist and a demagogue, but that's what happens in decayed societies. I mean, social inequality in the United States has never been this pronounced throughout our history. And it isn't going to get better. Because all of the whatever tepid constraints were on Wall Street have been lifted. <clears throat> what happened with this massive tax cut? These corporations, including Apple, which bought back one, a hundred, I think it's a hundred, uh, 
Must be a hundred million of their own stock. Is it a billion? Yes, probably you're right. hundred billion? That's insane. I mean, so you, you pump money into an overheated stock market, so there's no correlation between the value of the stock and the company. They, they don't correlate. You have $26 trillion in fabricated money pumped out by the Federal Reserve. And what do they do with it? What are these financial institutions? They don't do what traditional capitalists do, which is build a factory and create jobs. They buy back their own stock because their compensation packages are tied to it, or they gamble the same way the dot-com industry. The fracking industry doesn't make money. It's a big loser. It's valued on projected profits. And they pump close to $400 billion into it. So they get all of this money at 0% interest virtually. And they gamble with it. But it still has to be paid back. So how do they pay it back? Austerity. Student debt in the United States, $1.5 trillion. And thanks to the US Congress, if you declare personal bankruptcy, you still owe it. It just accrues interest. Wages are, I mean, the New York Times ran a story that talked a couple, a few weeks ago, that talked about how productivity had been raised by 77%, but wages had risen by 12%. And then if wages had been tied to productivity, workers' minimum wage would be over $20 an hour. But of course you have to keep wages depressed, because you need to keep people in debt. Debt peonage is a form of social control, as any African American will tell you. And what's happened within these deindustrialized pockets, and this is what's most frightening. So there are whole pockets of the United States, and let's be clear, the United States is a failed democracy now. There are no institutions, including the press, that can be authentically called democratic. That's a quote from Sheldon Wolin, our greatest political philosopher, who called out neoliberalism in the 1980s and was swiftly blacklisted, including where he taught at Princeton, where members of his own department wouldn't even speak to him. So you create a system where you have no mechanism by which you can institute piecemeal and incremental reform. You create stasis, paralysis, so that all of the mechanisms of government are redirected to consolidating the power and increasing the wealth of the 1% who are now looting as fast as they can on the way down. I mean, for this book, I travel all over the United States, and it's a very depressing landscape. City after city, Cleveland, Detroit, Camden, collapsing infrastructure, and of course, what we're seeing, as, as Marx understood in the late stage of capitalism, is these forces unable to extract the kind of profit anymore from an impoverished and beleaguered population is cannibalizing the very structures that make a capitalist democracy possible. 70% of American intelligence work is outsourced to private corporations like Bose Allen Hamilton, where Edward Snowden worked. 99% of Bose Allen Hamilton's budget comes from the US government. And you can be very sure that these corporations are not only working <coughs> on behalf of the intelligence agencies, but themselves. The privatization of education. Why? because the federal government in the United States spends $65 billion a year on education and the hedge funds want it. And they're getting it under Betsy DeVos. So you're seeing these forces now eat away at the very structures. <coughs>
that sustain the state. And this is particularly evident in marginal communities, deindustrialized communities, where largely poor people of color have been abandoned and poverty has been criminalized. I mean, with the slashing, because you don't get corporate taxes, you have, like, St. Louis County, for example, they write into their yearly budget that 30 or 40 percent of their income will come from fines that they impose on the poor. And that was part of the revolt, um, or major part of the revolt in Ferguson. And they create ridiculous, I'm not making any of this up. Uh, my favorite is obstructing pedestrian traffic, which means standing on a sidewalk. <coughs> That's, you can find open bottles, not mowing your lawn, it's endless. And Eric Garner in New York City was strangled to death because supposedly he was committing the crime of selling loose cigarettes, only he wasn't selling loose cigarettes. So they extract more and more and more from the poor, and they create totalitarian forms of social control. Militarized police, 3.3 Americans are murdered every day by police, and almost all of them are unarmed. And then the prison system. And you, and let's be clear, I mean, Canada's in prisons, it's First Nations people disproportionately as well. But we have the world's largest prison population, 25% of the world's prison population. We are 5% of the world's population. Why? I mean, half of the people in the American prison system have never been charged with physically harming another person. These bodies on the streets of deindustrialized urban centers do not generate money for the corporations that control the country. But if you lock them in a cage, they generate fifty or sixty thousand dollars a year, and the entire system of mass incarceration is now privatized. It's not the problem of private prisons. It's every function: the food service, the global telling, the phone service, uh, the commissaries. The it's all privatized, and that's why Dostoevsky said, "If you want to understand the heart of any society, look within its prison system." And within the American prison system, anywhere between 800,000 to 1 million prisoners work for for-profit corporations, and the list is all Hewlett Packard, McDonald's uniforms are made in prison, and, and you have prisons saying you don't need to hot pay gold to Bangladesh to hire sweatshop workers for 22 cents an hour, you can do it in the prisons. And, and, and if you look in those prisons, that is the model of what the corporate state is pushing towards because there are no constraints anymore. This is a workforce that can't organize, can't protest, isn't paid for sick days, isn't given a vacation, always shows up on time, and any time there's a problem, they're thrown in solitary confinement, which is a form of torture, and as I speak, there are 80,000 Americans tonight sitting in solitary confinement, and sometimes that solitary confinement lasts years, including the leaders of the Free Alabama prison up, work stoppage, indefinite solitary confinement. I mean, the only saving grace is that it's Alabama. Many of these states don't even pay. Uh, Alabama doesn't pay, uh, they don't pay anything. I think Louisiana pays four cents an hour. New Jersey, they pay 28 cents an hour. Actually, you make $28 a month in New Jersey. Um, but it being Alabama, it's so corrupt because all of the guards are only making minimum wage that you can get anything. And uh, I do a lot of work on prison advocacy and I was sitting home one day and got a phone, my phone, my cell phone rang and it was one of the leaders of the uh, Free Alabama movement who was sitting in uh, uh, solitary uh, on an uh, illegal cell phone. And I said, oh, let me run and get my tape recorder and I'll write it up. He says, oh, well, let me call the other two leaders. We'll do a conference call. <laughs> <laughs> Where is it going? We haven't spoken about 
climate disruption, which is horrifying and unstoppable, um, and exacerbated, certainly, in environmental policies, both here and in the United States. I mean, you as Canadians have a moral responsibility to stop that pipeline. And it isn't going to come by writing letters to Justin Trudeau. It's going to come, as the French understand, by occupying the center of Paris. The United States now is, despite the government shutdown and the vaudevillian presidency and, you know, and Trump's brought everyone down to his level. I mean, you know, Pelosi tells him not to give the State of the Union and he tells Pelosi she can't have a military plane. I mean, this is kind of... And the, and the networks love it. I mean, they're making a fortune of it. I mean, the networks are completely complicit. It's all about whatever tweet. I mean, a few weeks ago, it was just endless shows of Stormy Daniels. I mean, it's just, it's just rea it's reality television writ large. Um, and CNN is making more money than they ever made. It's not journalism at all. It has nothing to do with journalism. Um, but where are we going? So, I uh, studied classics at Harvard, and uh, if you look at the end of the Roman Empire, when they were trying to maintain a one million man army, and of course our military is out of control, half of all discretionary spending in the United States is spent on a military, which isn't even watered, it would be the king that watered it, with these endless and feudal wars uh, that are good for, they're not good for the Afghan people, they're not good for Iraqis, they're not good for Syrians, we've been in Syria eight years, I mean, uh, but it's very good for Raytheon and the weapons manufacturers, which is what it's about, which is also what the expansion of NATO is about. I mean, the, Reagan had promised Gorbachev that uh, there would be no expansion of NATO beyond Germany's borders once it was unified. Um, but, um, there are huge markets out there, so they pushed it right up to the rush I was in Warsaw uh, a while ago and got off uh, at the airport, and there were huge billboards from Raytheon. Yeah. Because they have to convert, they have to make it NATO compatible. So, at the end of empire, uh, traditionally, uh, empires, which at the beginning of empire are actually judicious about uh, military forays, um, attempt to recover their uh, declining power and prestige through military fiascos. So for instance, with the Athenian Empire, uh, they invade Sicily, um, the entire fleet is sunk, uh, most of the army is killed, and the empire disintegrates. 1956, and the British Empire is on a long, slow decline since the end of World War I, which was just an act of mass European suicide. Um, uh, they inv attempt to invade Egypt to retake the Suez Canal, which has been nationalized by Nasser, and they have to retreat in humiliation. And of course the death blow is that the pound sterling is dropped as the reserve currency, and Britain falls into a very deep depression. So the United States, I would argue, made the greatest strategic blunder in its history with the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, 18 years of warfare, um, the Taliban controls more territory in Afghanistan than when we were, went in. Iraq as a unified country does not exist. It, it's just create pockets of Libya, failed state after failed state, uh, empowering these jihadist groups. Um, and uh, so this drain on resources uh, is now threatening the dollar as the world's reserve currency. I mean, Alfred McCoy is a very fine historian argues that uh, by 2030 the American empire is dead. Certainly that is the death blow, when the dollar is dropped as the world's reserve currency. But the economic situation in the United States and globally is very fragile. Um, uh, the uh, kind of Ponzi schemes that Wall Street is engaging in 
are not sustainable over the long term. And uh, what I fear is that, and the New York Times wrote an editorial a few weeks ago that talked about the coming economic dislocation. There's arguments over how severe it will be. Economists like Nomi Prinz argue that it's going to be much worse than 2008 because there's no plan B. They can't lower interest rates any more than they've already lowered. Are they going to, are they going to print another $26 trillion worth of money? Uh, I mean, doesn't that get into hyperinflation? But, so, but something's coming. And the Democrats, the Democratic Party in the United States, which refuses, with the exception of Bernie Sanders, to address that social inequality, to blame the election of Trump on uh, Comey or the Podesta emails or Russian bots, uh, is as uh, destructive uh, or self-destructive a form of magical thinking as blaming in on 11 million undocumented workers, as if 11 million people who don't even earn minimum wage are responsible for the economic decline of the United <coughs> States. But that, if that stability is broken, then uh, you will see Trump, and, and we're watching that Trump who has no ideology, that ideological void being filled by the Christian right, you will see a much more pronounced form of Christian fascism, an embrace of violence, uh, either tacitly or openly, by the state uh, against demonized groups, um, and uh, uh, a kind of um, posturing throughout the world, which is reflected in figures like Bolton, who wants to go to war with Iran, Netanyahu. I mean, the, the, it, it's not just the democracy in the United States that is dying. It's because of neoliberal economics democracy that's dying in Britain, as I speak. Um, and I, you know, if history is any guide, uh, the ruling elites will align with the capitalists and the Liberal Party to prevent Corbyn from coming to power, even if it means the destruction of the state. Um, that's certainly what happened uh, between the Social Democrats, which created the Fry Corps in the 1920s against uh, a socialist uprising. But you have Hungary, France, I mean, uh, and so uh, what I fear is that the longer we refuse to address the enemy or the the rupturing of social bonds that have, been, have given rise to these kinds of uh, grotesque mutations, uh, then uh, even if we get rid of Trump, uh, we will, uh, he will be replaced by a figure that is uh, every bit as repellent, uh, perhaps with the cloying piety of his vice president, uh, but certainly <laughs> waiting in the wings in, in the United States is to essentially uh, provide the ideological cover uh, for a kind of corporate totalitarianism uh, are the Christian fascists. Uh, and I think at this point, um, what's incumbent upon all of us who care about open society, egalitarianism, um, and, uh, and justice, is that we have to begin to mobilize in advance. We have to mobilize a response. Uh, and that means uh, getting out into the street. Uh, it means forms of non-cooperation. Uh, it means uh, fighting back against corporate forces, which in theological terms are really forces of death when you count what they are doing to the ecosystem on which we depend for life. And it's daunting, and it's bitter, and it's depressing, and it's frightening. And yet, hope, we can't use the word hope if we don't resist. In the end, and I fall back on my own training uh, as a student of religion and theology, there is a moral imperative that we are called. Uh, it, it, you know, I don't know if we're going to I don't know if we can overthrow these forces. I don't know if we're even going to survive as a species. But I know that these corporate forces have us by the throat, and they have my children by the throat. And in the end, I don't fight fascists because I will win. <laughs>
I fight fascists because they are fascists. Thank you.